One of the biggest factors in the success of any building a nation save is the strength of the loan farm. And this year, with the changes to AI squad building and various other factors, it's become harder and harder to make that a possibility, especially in smaller nations. So we've spent the last two seasons formulating and trying every possible trick in the book to try to bring it back up to where it was before. And we found a few things. So let's talk about it. We have a massive summer ahead of us and a budget to match. So we're going to be doing a little bit of Wonder Kid shopping over on stream. So join us over there after you've caught up over here. And believe me, there is a lot of stuff to catch you up on. The VODs of all the streams can be found on the second channel linked in the description. They go out the day after every stream. You know the drill. And thank you for the support on the Premier League years video. I really do appreciate it. It's the reason why what you're about to see is actually a recap of season seven and eight, because I simply didn't have time to make another recap video. However, we're going to be doing them both today. This should hopefully be the last time this year that I have to do a double recap from going forward at least but it's going to be a lot today I suspect especially when we get to the loan stuff that we're going to have to discuss later in the video. I might even have a bit of time now to finally clean up this absolutely gopping mic stand. I know that'll please some people. So let's take you back now to the start of season seven of Building a Nation with Sirens over in Malta. Last year we had just barely missed out on qualifying for the knockouts of the Europa League and the aim for this year was a very simple one. Try to go one better and make that a reality with a little help from our other multi his friends hopefully they could start pulling their weight sometime soon that'd be nice and we were extremely busy in the transfer window over the course of season seven uh, for reasons that you'll understand very soon but there was a couple of little outs which we definitely need to discuss first because there is some mad stuff in here well two things especially one mostly the first of those was the loss of ronnie shallow now you'll know that last season we talked about how we had a huge bid from saudi and we decided to just turn it down and hope that we could just either find some way to keep him which was very unlikely or at least get use of his goals in the meantime while we tried to find a long-term replacement for him so as you can see he has actually now left but not to saudi so the situation with him was a fairly simple one we knew that in january he would end up signing a pre-contract with someone most likely so once the transfer window in the summer had shut and we knew that we'd at least have him till january we managed to arrange a transfer deal for him to go to austrian club wolfsburger and well i mean we got 3.4 million pounds for him which is actually i think our record sale at the time so we were very happy with that and rightly so because he was definitely by far our best player and it meant that we got to keep him at least for a few more months until the January transfer window before he would finally make his move over to Austria. Uh, you'll also note that despite him moving to Austria, he hasn't actually played a single match for them just yet. He's played more games for Israel since he left than he actually has for uh, his new club. Now, he has had an injury, but it's only relatively new there, so I don't know what's going on. Either way, we had a little bit of money to play with and needed to find replacements. But that isn't actually the big out I wanted to talk about, because if you recall in the last video, I showed you Mohamed El Shazli after his return from his loan move uh, to Pyramids, and I said, hey, he's got this enormously large rating and value as a lot of our players do the issue is this the clubs that can actually afford to buy players for that kind of money aren't interested in them because if you look at who those sort of clubs are saudi are really the only options and even they seem to really don't really want them that much and the clubs that do want them can't afford them so it actually gives you a bit of stability at the least in the meantime and that was until la galaxy came along basically la galaxy have a tycoon i've never seen a tycoon in the mls before and i don't really know how that even works but i assume it's because there might be a salary cap but i don't know if there's a spending cap on transfer fees so nevertheless they dropped it's not actually 15 they dropped 11 million pounds on mohammed el shazli from us and we of course went well yes we'll absolutely do that and as a result, we got a huge amount of money for El, for El Shazli. And that's, I feel like, the only time in the save that's ever likely to happen. But it was very, very strange indeed. But I did feel like it was an overinflated transfer fee. So that won't be happening again, even if we do get a large bid in the meantime. Because I do want to keep an, you know, an element of realism, even though it is FM, right? So we just kind of did what we always do. Going after cheap buys and try and just build the club up with some uh, loan farmable players, potentially. We will get to that in a moment. But let's just talk about the players that have joined us that actually sort of have impacts right now. Because there has still been quite a few this year. There's been a lot of transfers in general. The first of whom is Iore Melman. I think I actually showed him in the last video, but it has been a while since, uh, so I've kind of forgotten about that. Uh, he was our record signing at the time. 1.4 million pounds was a lot for us to drop on a player. We structured the deal to make sure it would happen. We couldn't believe a guy from Colo Colo would even join us. We suspect that it's due to his unambitious personality because no other players from any clubs in that region, really, uh, certainly not at his club, would even consider talking to us. It was like under any circumstances, but he would. He's come in now, and the idea with him basically was to essentially retrain him to potentially take Shallow's place as our Trecortista. And that's sort of what's been going on right now. Now, he's really not kind of 
yeah, there yet. Um, he still very much needs a lot of work, but we're getting him working on especially things like his off-the-ball composure, decisions, anticipation, stuff like that that really is going to matter for him playing that role for us. So in time, I'm hoping that he can become that player for us. His name isn't actually Eure Melman, obviously. His name's actually Joan Valencia. Uh, we just call him that because of his unambitious personality and because he's six foot five and chat thought he seemed like the giraffe from Madagascar, because reasons. So that's how he ended up with his name. But now, a signing I'm very, very happy with indeed. And this is Suleimane Sangare. Asek Mimosas, as most of you know, are an absolute talent hotbed. And especially in this save, they've been producing some absolutely beautiful players. And he very much is one of those. Um, now, obviously, he came in originally being an advanced playmaker out wide, but we've been using him as an advanced playmaker in the center because, I mean, look at his attributes, frankly. He's 21. He costs us 200 grand. And it's these types of players that we actually can legitimately pick up. Now, he does have a release clause uh, of like five and a half million pounds, which is still a lot of money for a club at our level. But I would like to try to figure out a way to get rid of it if possible, because he's actually looking a lot better than we expected. This year, mostly made substitute appearances because of a Fifi in the squad, but five goals and eight assists is not bad over the course of his first year at the club. Very, very pleased with him indeed. I mean, just look at his hat. He's brilliant. And then also from the Ivory Coast, we have Sekou Fofana, who is a winger. Again, we found a couple of really high quality wingers, which would have worked really nicely in our old tactic. But now that we're playing a back five with wingbacks, doesn't really work so well because these guys sure as shit can't play that role. However, we're retraining him to play as a striker. If we can get that finishing up a little bit, I think there's a real quality in him. And it's nice to have a left footed player around the club too, because he's got the speed. Good player, £150,000. Can't really say no to him. And because he's 18, he will be a homegrown player for us in various European competitions. We also dropped £250,000 on Tony Sunday from Carno Pillars. And again, these are the types of signings that we can make. We don't have to drop huge amounts of money on them, but they're generally speaking bargains, frankly. And he's been operating in that sort of defensive midfield halfback role for us uh, over the course of this year. And in fact, has made 34 appearances. Now, because he's playing as a halfback, which means he doesn't get forward and attacks, he's not taller, so he doesn't go up for set pieces. The game tends to punish, I've noticed, uh, defensive midfielders because they don't score goals, they don't get assists, they don't make key passes. They're just there making interceptions and doing all kinds of lovely stuff and as a result they tend to get low ratings no matter what happens which is a bit disappointing but I've still been very happy with Tony's output and again he'll be homegrown in a few years and I think he has a really really bright future I believe he does have a contract extension clause I guess he does which would be lovely and look at the mentals on him next we have Sifu Maleka another of these chaps that we've got here now he's actually out on loan at Hamron and that is a big surprise for me unfortunately he's not going to stay there out on loan because as you'll see up here uh yeah he um damage his cruciate ligament, which means he's going to be out for three to six months. They're never going to extend that loan. And it's a real disappointment because he's the exact type of guy that if you can get them out on loan, you can just keep them there. And he would have massively changed. I know you can't see his CA and PA here. It's like three star, five star, basically. He's unbelievable. And it's just a real shame that he's got that injury at the worst possible time. Because for me, he's a future South African international. 275 grand from Stellenbosch fantastic but next is a player i'm very excited about and this is his name isn't actually mayhem sultan as you can imagine although it's not far off it's actually matham sultan he's an iraqi international left back who genuinely might be one of the best like iraqi regens i've ever found on fm i, I find that they do produce good players sometimes but he looks to be the real deal nine caps already for iraq he's not the quickest and we are sort of retraining him to play that wing back role and he may end up out on loan given that there's the depth of hydara and palacio in that spot but either way i think he's a really solid young player who could actually have a decent future here and what a great name too and the last of the sort of players that we've brought in you can see we really haven't spent that much money we have really just dived into trying to find the best youth prospects that we can try to hopefully develop ourselves and that is mohammed reda belkebla of algeria it's coming for one hundred and thirty thousand pounds um, from buloizdad um, apologies for the pronunciation there he's a sort of central midfielder we'll probably retrain him to play slightly deeper in fact i believe we're already doing that uh, so we can drop a little bit into here and potentially have a future in the midfield for our team or maybe find him alone potentially but again, he might be one of those guys that's just slightly too good for that. But FMB weird like that, right? Okay, with those signings, ins and outs out of the way, it's time to talk about the additions and stuff that we've been working on over the past two years for the loan farm. Because in the last video, you might recall, I actually mentioned uh, in a comment to it that we'd found something new. And ironically, since then, we've gone through about three or four different things and like, oh, this is the next big thing. This is the next big thing. And what we've ended up with over this two year, two season period is essentially just a toolkit of extra things you can try to hopefully improve your loan farm slightly. Now, again, results may vary depending on the league you're managing in, semi -pro the professional status of the clubs and various other factors. But I just wanted to give you everything we've got so far that maybe one of the things might work for you potentially to try to bridge that gap because it does seem that this year especially, the gap between you and the teams you're loaning to in terms of the qualities of the players matters massively. And that quite simply, clubs will not bid on your players for loan because they simply do not think that that player is ever going to be willing to join them on loan, even if the player might actually consider it. 
and that seems to be the reason for the lack of loan offers. Now, sometimes you'll also get the loan offer, but then the player rejects it. We do have a really nice workaround for that as well. So we're going to start off with the thing that we initially used to bridge the gap, which is not to do with loans at all. Going to just switch to the transfer page here. So you can see, I mean, look at the sheer number of players that have signed for us this season. You'll notice there's a lot of freebies in here. Uh, now, a lot of these guys are either freebies from like amateur clubs, players that were released, uh, the free Brazilians. That's a really good method of getting free players. And you're going to need them if you want to try this particular one out. So this was an idea from Hadrian. So shout out to him. Most of the stuff I'm going to discuss was not thought of by me. It was chat's ideas that I've just incorporated. There is one thing I had added myself, but we're going to talk about that in a minute. So the first thing, because of the changes to AI squad building, it seems this year that AI clubs, computer control clubs, want more permanent transfers. They don't really like relying on loans as much, which makes sense in terms of real life, but it is bad for the type of safe that we're potentially doing. So we figured, is there a way that we can actually help them out getting permanent signings? Because you know, like you trial players and sometimes they get picked up, but it does seem a bit less effective this year. Still useful, but not as effective as it once was. So we decided to try something out where we picked up a load of players who were sort of between like one star CA, four star PA at most really, low world rep and no international caps or anything like that. So as I said, amateur players, as you would normally pick up but slightly lower quality ones so if you're a few seasons into the save now and actually doing quite well some of the guys that you might not consider might be perfect for this the kind of guys that look a little bit like this with their uh, sort of star ratings and stuff sometimes you can go up as high as three or four stars on this but that's kind of what you're looking for those types of players and essentially you just bring them in on youngster future prospect maybe fringe player if they're a bit older but you've got to be careful and try to keep the wages as low as possible if they want anything over about 300 pound a week don't bother with them there's plenty of other guys that will take really low wages what you want to do bring them in the moment they join you just offer them out for free transfers to other clubs in your league you can propose it like by excluding foreign clubs you know how it works so for example with this guy who was particularly poor all you'd want to do is go into offer transfer room uh target transfer offer like that targets exclude foreign clubs one thing you can also do if you don't get bid straight away is add in a uh, selling team wage contribution uh, that means if they actually have a wage potentially this guy does weirdly but i think it's because i'm not in a transfer window i can't do this currently but yeah you can normally do that too and if their wages are really low it costs you basically nothing and what we noticed is that a lot of them were actually getting bites from other clubs in our league and they actually were willing to take these guys off of us the board won't care because you signed them for free so you're not making a loss on the player if anything they see it as you getting the wages off the bill so it gets a few extra players out to other multi sides we've managed to do that a fair amount this year as you can see from the transfers out over here there's a lot of freeze in here there's a decent amount of loans as well but there's also a lot of freeze on top of that that's just helped boost up some of the other sides in our league and close the gap in current ability to us slightly meaning that they now are more likely to actually want to take our loan so that's certainly something you can try out potentially it's a lot of legwork but it definitely can have some results but something that can also help out is the unwanted list something that i've not really used very much in fm and we found that by adding a load of the players to the unwanted list and then setting them essentially because they have zero transfer value anyway um what it did it very rarely actually got you transfer bids but what it did seem to do is reveal interest from other sites now you will get a load of random bids from china i don't know why you just will um but in amongst that you'll also get quite a lot of bids from sides in your league again or at the very least it will now show up as interest for those teams which means that you can then offer them directly to that team and generally speaking they will actually say yes and you can get the deal done sometimes as well they'll actually come on with loan offers randomly after all that it's very strange fmb weird like that but again try that out as well potentially and if you are going to do this make sure that you sign the players to either one year contracts if you're in the summer or six month contracts tracks if you're doing it in January because that way um, you're not tied to like long-term deals on these guys and they'll just get released at the end of the season and especially is what I've noticed is that the guys that don't get free transfers or loans from that at the end of the season because they're now counted as based in Malta or whatever country you're currently in I would say about 70 to 80 percent of them just end up joining Maltese clubs on free transfers when they expire their contracts with you anyway so it's kind of best of both worlds so we were pretty happy with that and we thought okay it's great but it's a lot of work and it's quite a stop gap at best and it doesn't really help the loan farm situation and then uh, eris from chat had the brilliant idea of what if we tried the same thing but with part exchange you know where you say hey we'll give you a player and you give us a player never really used that mechanic in fm before but it is there and that is what you're seeing down at the bottom here you'll see that we've got a lot of part exchange deals here where we've paid a tiny a bit of money for players from various clubs in malta but in exchange for that uh, they have received players from us you'll see here that zabar actually took three players from us all these on loan by the way i'll understand that in a second as a result of this part exchange deal for brandon ferrugia they got abba alfred haji Torreo, Traore, and mario madrid all players that we couldn't seem to find loans for all of a sudden were just wanted for loan very strange now initially when we first did this it was deadline day in january and we got so many successful ones out with this as you'll see from pretty much all of this stuff here we went oh christ is this just utterly broken i can assure you it is not it worked really well one time on the deadline day in january this year and since then it's been much more hit and miss uh, as you're about to see but needless to say it's certainly worth trying i'll show you how you do it and the best use of it seems to be from our experience so far that if you've got a player who a club is interested in but they haven't bid on or they have bid and the players rejected the loan this seems to be a great way to get that loan to actually happen so i'm just going to choose balsan youth as a random example here if we're going to go into their under 19 squad because this is where you do it basically you just click on one of their players 
doesn't have to be anyone good. In fact, it's better if it's not. Go to make offer. Have a look over here. If it says they have a lot of potential, don't bother. They won't sell them to you for this type of deal. It's really strange. Just keep scrolling down on the top here until you find one that says don't consider them to have a long-term future. Then suggest terms. Want that sort of stuff. It doesn't really matter because it's minimal money at the level we're at at this stage. But then what you want to do is go into here and go players to exchange. Now, sometimes the club will literally be interested in a couple of players that you already have, and therefore they'll get a second pop-up here that will guarantee you that they want those players. So all you do is go into the thing, it'll say like your assistant suggests, add those players in. Now, they don't have that in this scenario. But what you can do is go to your loan listed players and just dump in a few guys that you fancy um, to loan out, basically. So just a couple of guys here. You can have up to five here, but we've only ever seen it work with three. But in here, you can actually do loans as part of the part exchange. And, oh, that's weird. But obviously we're not in a loan window right now, which is the reason why it's deleting it when I tried to add it. But if you're in a transfer window, it should work fine. And that's all we did, basically. Now, if I try to do this, most likely this is going to go red. Oh, we didn't. <laughs> See what I mean? My point is, sometimes they will just randomly go, you know what? Yeah, we'll have those guys from you. Now, they'll have probably accepted him on loan as well, except obviously we're not in a loan window. So were we in the summer, they'd have probably actually gone for that. But it does seem to be quite random which ones they will and won't accept unless there's explicit interest in that player. But if there is explicit interest, they will almost always take the player and the player always seems to agree. So it's just a nice way of getting a couple of extra loans out using part exchange. It will cost you, sometimes they will do it for free. Sometimes it will cost you 10 grand here, 20 grand there. But when you're at the level we're at, that's chump change generally speaking what i will say is if you try to do this at a much higher level if you're like say a top 15 nation in the world uh they will ask for absurdant mo exorbitant money um inferno from chat they wanted 48 million pounds to take three loans so again this is more of a stopgap but it does work. It's just another thing to have in your toolkit. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is something that we tried on the last stream. Now, I haven't seen this work personally for me just yet, but I have been assured that it can do in the right circumstances. And that is hiring an intermediary and then cancelling it immediately. So if I just use this chap here as an example, although I don't know if this is actually... Oh, it would work, actually. Obviously, his contract expires in like a month, so it won't really work as well for him. But if you're in a transfer window, go to hire intermediary, click it, and then click cancel. For whatever reason, this seems to alert clubs in the game that your player is available for loan. And you won't get any permanent transfer bids, but you will suddenly get random loan bids. Now, if you try this in January, and again, I have no idea why this is, you will suddenly be bombarded with loan bids from Australian clubs. I have no idea why it's Australian clubs. I guess it's because that's their main window, but it's only Australian clubs will seem to bid on your players. But I have heard if you do this in the summer, there is a potential opportunity to get more bids from domestic sides for your players. I don't know why. FM is strange like that, but these are all the little things we've tried and had some minor success in certain areas with just getting some extra players out on loan. Along with just the normal one of actually just going in, offering via transfer room, offering for a loan, selecting this, not using foreign clubs here, uh, and instead going offer clubs your nation. For some reason, that seems to work better. Just doing that every now and then does seem to drive up more interest. Don't know why. It does take a little while to do, though. It is worth noting that using the unwanted list, you can't have players on the unwanted list and the development list at the same time, so you kind of got to pick or choose which one of those you're going to use. Uh, I would use one for a little bit if you want to try the first thing we talked about out and then shove them all back on the development list after that if it doesn't work out, basically. But it's just more tools that you could maybe use Maybe they'll work, maybe they won't. It depends on the save and depends on all sorts of stuff that we just don't really know about. But we have had some success with most of these things this season. So I just wanted to alert you to it because, hey, it might help you out. In one of these things might help you somehow. Apologies if that was a little bit of a mess. There's just so many things I wanted to talk about. And I didn't have like perfect examples for every single thing because of the time of the year that we're actually at. One thing I will also say is that letting the players get released at the end of the season as well, that's why the short contracts are useful. They do seem to get picked up quite a lot. Uh, we did a little test actually a little bit further into the future here where I put them all on a short list after I released them, including guys that have been on loan this year just as a test and i believe close to 80 percent of them found other clubs in malta so definitely something to look into but that's enough of that let's talk about how we actually got on in the league this season uh, it was a little bit of an unbeaten season little cheeky little unbeaten season in there uh, won the league by 12 points in the end this was with the new tactic the first time we played the full season with the brand new five at the back approach to things and apart from a little tweaks in there it was very very solid i mean the one thing i'll say about it is we don't score as many goals as we ever were before we scored 90 last season this year it dropped down to 78 but you'll note the eight conceded that definitely made a difference. Uh, we've become much, much more stable at the back. You can see that the gap between Hamroon and everybody else is still massive. They were 12 points behind us, but they were 14 clear of third place Goodyear, and then obviously massively clear of uh, fourth place Hibernians. So yeah, uh, and that was a very close battle for the final European places there. Unfortunately, Marsa going down with, well, <laughs> negative, negative 50 goal difference and not winning a single game all season. 
Not ideal from them, really. In the second tier, Sweetie and Mosta were both promoted. Uh, Sweetie with an absolute runaway victory in there. So you'll also note that Floriana, who were relegated last year, who I just assumed would come straight back up, uh, they weren't even really close. They were five points from it in the end, but at one point they were down in like 10th in the league at the midway stage. They are very, very strange team. Vida Xenia and Palacio. Basically, the wingbacks are absolutely crucial. If you can get good wingbacks with good agility and balance, especially, and decent passing, uh, they can make a massive difference to this sort of setup. And it's been fabulous for us. But we'll talk more about why it works so well a bit later in the video because it kind of works on two levels. In fact, screw it, I'll talk about it now. Basically, it's great for dominating the ball against teams that you'd expect to win against, and it allows you to just grind out loads of opportunities, especially with the wingbacks bombing forward. But I've noticed that it's also really good against bigger sides, despite a lot of the attacking roles, because it allows us to sit deep with quite a lot of defensive starting positions, and it makes us really good on the counter-attack too, because a lot of the attacking roles make those late runs. So we can get these fast breaks going whilst also being fairly solid at the back. And it's great having a tactic that you can work in two different ways without actually having to make any tactical tweaks. It's kind of the dream, really. So it's worked out quite nicely for us. Speaking of us and bigger sides, uh, it's time to talk about Europe. Now, annoyingly, that issue that we had last season with the um, game not caching enough match data for us to actually show the early European games is present in both of these seasons. And I figured out what it is. So if you're suffering from the same problem as I know a few of you were, I can fix it for you. I just can't fix it for this. I'll be fixed from now on. So basically, there was an update in FM a little while ago. It must have been a few, literally before Christmas at this stage. And I think it reset one of the settings. So what you're going to want to do is go to overview. I think it's an overview. It might be in other things, but I need to say you're looking for match storage megabyte. Now, this I always have set to 300 megabytes to give the most amount of matches possible. And for some reason, this was reset to default. And I don't know how it got reset to default, but it was. And that's probably what was causing it. So if you're noticing that all of a sudden your save is not caching matches for the, like, at least the entire season that you're in, go in and check this setting and make sure that it's set to 300 megabytes and not the default, basically, because I don't know what the default is. So give that a try and that should hopefully fix things for you if you're having that issue. But anyway, Europe just have to do it a bit differently this time. Now, naturally, going into the Champions League in the early stages means you get some relatively easy results, which is exactly what we got as we faced off against Armenian side Ararat. Armenia with a 6-0 victory in the home leg, quickly followed by a 4-0 victory to take us through 10-0. Where we would then draw Hammerby of Sweden, though, in the second qualifying round. Not an easy tie whatsoever, but we did get a 3-1 victory in the home game, which surprised everybody. Unfortunately, when we went to Sweden, uh, we, despite taking an early lead through an Afifi penalty, they did get goals back very quickly, and unfortunately, we were knocked out on penalties in the second round of qualifying. Not ideal for us at all. As we drew Rapid Bucharesti of Romania in the next round, a lovely 2-1 victory in the home game gave us at least a chance going to the away match where we were able to go and win 2-0 thanks to goals from Pierre, Camger and Lend and John Guerrero to push us through to the playoff round of the Europa League. Where we'd face off against Mulder and a 3-1 victory in the home leg put one foot there before going to Norway and well we were 2-0 up inside 50 minutes in this game and that was 5-1 on aggregate. They did get a late goal back but it was a relatively comfortable progression through to the group stage of the Europa League and given how well we'd done last year nearly qualifying for the knockouts we felt that just based on this alone we looked a lot stronger and we surely had to be getting through to the knockouts this time around and we started off fabulously a 4-1 victory away in Denmark there with Guerrero again grabbing goals those guys were just absolutely killing it before we stayed in Denmark for our second match which was away at Norgeland and the results were a little bit more mixed but just getting a win on the board early days is just really nice to have sadly 3-1 defeat there Melman did at least score a goal for us which is nice right we can finally go back to me actually showing you the full match stats now as we pulled off for me this is the biggest victory of the save so far Sirens 4 Sporting 3. Incredible scenes in this game. Unbelievable. Guerrero, Shallow, Palacio, and Mateus Diaz getting us the goals. Guerrero and Shallow were just linking up with everybody. It was fabulous. I mean, it was just an absolute ding dong battle. You can see that every time we started to grab a lead, they would just come straight back in there. But that goal from Diaz in the end was what actually made it 4 2. Um, I believe it was 4 2. Yeah, it was. They did get one late back. But I mean, what a result that was for us. And that meant two wins out of three and six points already. Remember, we got eight last year, I think. And we then went one better as we traveled to Bulgaria and put five past Levski Sophie. I mean, Mohamed Afifi scored, Vida Xenia got one, Guerrero and Al Assas getting involved as well. Just fabulousness again from us. And that was nine points on the board and that pretty much qualified us for some kind of knockout football, no matter what. But then we really made sure as we put four past Maribor as well. Guerrero, Shallow, Kamga and Lend, and of course Melman. Those guys were just contributing so much to this team. It was unbelievable. Especially the 1,000 IQ free kick from Kamga and Lend. This is right up his... What are you doing? You're practicing your golf swing. This feels like his... Uh, Liquid Football Part 7? Uh, uh, <laughs> it's 3-1. Just wasn't the way I thought that was going to go. 
Then we played Aston Villa. Lost two goals to one. Not really a huge surprise when you look at the goal scorers in this game. But actually, you know, we gave them an okay go of it, surprisingly. Then we traveled to Turkey and a relatively poor performance saw us lose 1-0 to Galatasaray. But we were already through to the next round at this point. We knew that we just needed maybe one point to get top 16. And we did, in fact, get that point at home against Trabzonspor. It was annoying as we were actually winning until the 94th minute here. Now, we'd beaten Trabzonspor 6-2 in Turkey a couple of seasons ago. Figured we'd get the win here, but sadly, it wasn't to be. Uh, it did cost us some coefficient points, but you can see that's a lot of wins for us in the Europa League and ended up with us coming 14th on the board. Four wins, three losses and a draw for 13 points. And it's so close to being 15 points. If we'd have just got that result over the line against Trabzonspor in the end, we could have been right on the outskirts of the top eight, which really does show you how much we've come along this season. There was a few games where perhaps we were a little bit lucky though. So it kind of balances out, I would say. Finishing above the likes of Ajax in there, Villarreal. Like that was some good performances from us and really starting to show a lot more in Europe. And that, of course, earned us a draw against one of the weaker sides. And that team was 22nd place Sturmgrat. And we thought, you know what? That's doable. And then entered the most infuriating pair of matches I think I've played in at least a year and a half. So we travelled to Austria for the first leg. Uh, we lose 4-3. Now, we were actually 4-0 down in this off of their first four shots. And you'll see in total, they had 1.05 XG scored four times. It was horrifying. Uh, we Literally, being 4-0 down in that position where we were absolutely battering them was very frustrating. But that's how it goes. Literally, those three goals in six minutes, sorry, six goals, three goals in six minutes for us actually pulled the tie a lot closer. And we thought maybe we could get something there. But how on earth we didn't win this game? It's just one of those things. But there you go. It is just one of those things. It happens. You can also see, look at the key passes from both wingbacks in this game five and four respectively we thought if we play that well at home surely we can turn this around so the downside is that we didn't play as well at home but we still played quite well at home and we ended up losing three now <laughs> They scored seven goals off of just over two XG against us. <laughs> Meanwhile, we failed to score... No, we scored three off of nearly five. It's just one of those things. Obviously, XG is not the biggest representation over a couple of matches, but it was quite infuriating to see us constantly miss chances and just concede every shot they had. They only had three shots on target in this game. I think they scored seven goals off of eight shots on target against us. It wasn't the best time, to be fair. To go out 7-3 was... It stung a little bit, you might say. But not to worry, because we had other Maltese friends in Europe too, and they were doing business. Because first up was Zabar, and they were in the first qualifying round of the Conference League, but they got a Samaranese team and were able to win both legs and win by six goals to nothing to progress themselves into a tie against BK Hecken of Sweden. Very, very tough. Did get a draw in Sweden, so we thought maybe it was possible, but the 2-0 home defeat really did put them in the ground. But at least they progressed through a round and got some points for Malta along the way. It was a similarly heartbreaking story for Birkikara, as they got a Gibraltarian team of Europe point and beat them 2-0 in both legs to progress. They then got two draws against Latvian side Riga, but then went out on penalties. They were very, very close to progressing to the third round of qualifying, but there's definitely progress being made. It was just nice to get those like double win rounds in that first round, because that's a lot of points in those early stages that makes a huge difference, uh, especially as we're not going to be getting those points next year, which put all the pressure on, as usual, Hamrun, who can always be relied on Pond to go a little bit further. And they did very well in their first game against Dinamo Auto Tiraspol of Moldova, getting through 7-1 on aggregate. They then beat Actobi of Kazakhstan, 4-0 on aggro, relatively simple, into the third round. Then they drew Larnacus of Cyprus. They got a draw away from home. We thought, great, come back and win the home game. And then they just didn't. Uh, they lost 2-1 at home to them. Very disappointing there. Frankly, not really what we would have been looking for. Goalkeeping errors uh, massively cost them in this home game here. It was horrible goalkeeping. Uh, I think the keeper got like a 5.3 or something in this game. It was not particularly ideal. And that meant Hamrin were out in the third round. And we normally expect better from them. Um, so it was basically just down to us. But at least they'd gained some points in the early stages. And oh boy, did we. Seven points on the board this year. Uh, um, and bear in mind, we were losing a 1.1 year. So we gained six points overall this year. And that's a huge step in the right direction. By far the best year we've had in Malta so far both with us winning points in the group stages, but also with those teams getting through those first qualifying rounds, it makes a huge difference because that can literally, those three sides winning on that day can actually gain you like 1.2 points per time. It's fantastic. Ironically, all of that actually only moves us above Bosnia and Slovenia and into 28th spot uh, because Hungary have also managed to gain a little bit uh, this year, oh, albeit ever so slightly. But the key thing is we go 28th and the progression is still being made. It's weird when you gain loads from a 4.5 season and gain barely anything from a seven, but that's just how it works. Now, the problem is though, next year, the teams were going to be going in a round later in the Conference League, so no more slapping about Samaranese sides, and that was definitely going to be a tough bridge to uh, cross for us, and potentially for them. And now, youth intake. We get to talk about one. Isn't life grand? This was our youth intake, and we actually got a player that might be not awful. Top talent, apparently. Matthew Pace, let's show you him. He's, like, attribute-wise, he's actually fairly solid, and generally speaking, I mean, look at that. Premier League standard player. That's based off... 
that says to me that there might actually be a future Maltese International in here with Matthew Pace. So that's very, very exciting. Still only 15 as well, like a long way for him to go. Um, seeing a lot of random stuff here, but he's definitely the best youth player we've had by a country mile in this save so far. It was the first youth intake we've had that wasn't basically all ease. We were actually promised a C-rated player, ironically a goalkeeper, turned out to be a midfielder but there you go <laughs> but he is nothing compared to the guy that we get in season eight that i'm going to show you later in the video because my god we might actually have a usable player stats wise for the season john was absolutely carrying us yet again 29 goals not quite the sort of close to 40 that we're used to out of um, shallow and the like but you know pierre camber and lend as well 13 and 13 absolutely goated fantastic work from him 26 goal contributions from central midfield is what i want but i want to draw your attention to the assists vida Zinia, 24 assists in 36 games i think up until about match day 17 he was tracking at one per game uh, and then some injuries and he was a bit unfit for certain things consistency issues for him a little bit plus just me tweaking the tactics a little bit dropped him out of it a little bit but still 24 assists this season for him is wild and it does show you how important the wingbacks are in this system however uh don't expect these numbers from vida next year because it's been injury hell for him as we're going to talk about in a moment now as for the loan farm you'll see it's up to 66 which is good which is solid so it's mostly two star ca seems to be like the cap on what we can get at the moment in terms of getting players out but it's certainly better than it was um but you can see there's some decent potential on a lot of these guys that have gone out on loan this year now at the end of this season what i actually ended up doing was releasing a load of the guys that were currently on loan because i wanted to test the theory if they would actually get picked up by other multi sides which as i already explained earlier earlier they did i would say it was about 80 percent of them got picked up which means that at the start of the next season which i'm going to show you in a minute they all actually we dropped down to about mid 40s in terms of players on loan so when i show you the amount of players we have at the end of next season bear that number in mind and the aim for season eight was quite a simple one we just wanted to go further into the europa league if we could potentially or maybe outskirts of the champion oh, we want to see if it was possible to get champions league but europa league was definitely the target now for the start of season eight and for transfer strategies this year we were kind of went back to our normal approach of basically just trying to sign some players that would might be good for the loan farm because we managed to bridge that gap to the point where now players we were bringing in generally speaking if we offered them out the day they came in even if they didn't find a loan straight away they usually found a loan by the second time we offered them out in around about 80 to 85 percent of cases which is exactly what we wanted and i cannot stress enough how important it is that the moment the player joins you in your window get them on the dev list get them offered out to clubs in malta or whatever league you're in and even if it doesn't work the first time doing it a second time when it fails seems to give you a lot of success as well so just make sure you do those two steps every single time and believe me it will do massive things for you hopefully provided everything else is in the right state but before we talk about ins we're going to talk about one out for this year because there really only was one major out over the course of season eight but unfortunately it was an annoyingly big one and that was Suleimani Sangare um just nothing we could do about it it's, we got five million pounds for him which is obviously great but it's meaningless to us because we didn't need the money at this stage and he was basically our starting midfielder for much of this season he had really flown into the team this year completely taken over from a fifi and you can see it well, why wouldn't he leave he's on 30 grand i mean there's definitely reasons why he would leave he was genuinely a fab i can't believe he's not got Cote d'Ivoire caps at this point he's unbelievable so it's such a shame to see him go but we couldn't do anything about it couldn't give him a new contract because of the interest from elsewhere he wasn't interested there's nothing we could do so it was a real shame to lose him and it's been a real difficulty replacing him but that's life we're going to be struggling with that all season i think as for ins we started off with doda gay from diambars again senegal ivory coast doing absolute bits as per one hundred twenty-five thousand pounds solid midfielder he was potentially an option to replace Sangari, but you can see that the quality levels aren't quite there, and I believe he's actually older than Sangari. It might be a year younger, actually. Needless to say, he's decent, but he's not Sangari. <laughs> Next, we have Adel Cabal, a uh, Algerian centre-back, and again, we liked him because he actually has good heading for a centre-back, which is a rarity. 225 grand, hasn't played that much this year, been a little bit of a letdown but we just wanted lots of strength and depth in center backs and i think he does provide that he's a fringe player so he doesn't complain we then brought in isaac uh, panazio and you can see again he's found a loan at goodyear united we then tried to plug the gap left by ronnie shallow a little bit by signing stuart fraser on loan from liverpool for the season it's worked out okay he did have a couple of injuries over the course of the year he certainly won't be coming back because we've actually found some options that seem to work for us but attribute wise he's not too bad for the role that we were trying to play him in eight goals uh, only two assists but he did often make a lot of substitute appearances in the end and we were paying quite a lot we were paying his full wage if i recall to make this one happen but next we come to probably my favorite signing of the year and a guy that could potentially lead us forward this is henry watara 250 grand another of the asec mimosas contingent uh he was actually worse rated by our scouts when he joined us but look at his attributes he's fast he can finish he's composed he takes great first touches he's got great flair as well actually um he's just a fabulous striker 27 goals for us this year at 19 i believe he will have counted as homegrown as well if i remember correctly either way for 250k he has been sensational and it's these types of signings again that have really carried us so if we could just find a guy like him but that's like a 
attacking midfielder that can maybe do a bit of passing too. That would be lovely. We also picked up Branko Tanic from Partizan, who I was very surprised would actually discuss terms with us, but he would. And again, didn't want a huge amount of money. It seems like occasionally players just do that. Now, the aim for him actually was to bring him in and retrain him to be the Trecortista in this type of system because we really liked his attributes. But then Floriana in the second tier said, how about a loan? And we said, absolutely lads because getting a guy of two star ca quality on loan to a second tier side was absolutely fabulous for us and he's had a relatively good year there seven goals and seven assists in the second tier for floriana and they've had a very good season so that's just nice to see him developing and he could be one of the guys that maybe will just stay out on loan forever and could be a genuine worldie out on loan and that's what we want we also signed mohammed watara also from asic mimosas nearly for the same price as his namesake no sadly they are not related it would have been cool if they were brothers though just to give us a bit more cover around the team we hope to find a loan for him though in true we also picked up Abdu Ndoy, uh, a right wing back who we definitely needed for depth this season because let me talk about Vida in a minute, but we still had no one behind Vida anyway, really. And for 165 grand from Janarash on foot, he looks to be the real deal. Not really the same type of player as Vida. Uh, he's a bit more defensively sound, which is always good to have. Good on both feet as well. Not the quickest and doesn't have the best agility and balance compared to Vida, but still, he's a fabulous player. His mentals are, well, quite frankly, mental. And hopefully long term, he could potentially be the successor to Vida should we lose him at some point even though they are very different types of players. He's still unbelievable for 165k. We then dropped 1.3 million on Thrasos Dimitriou, uh, mostly because Cypriot International actually can head a football, great in the air, seemed okay, hasn't really featured much for us just yet, did cost us a lot of money. I think he's actually one of our top earners now, so that might have been a bit of a mistake, but sometimes you just gotta, you don't try, you'll never know. And the last player that's sort of worth talking about for me is yet another from Generation on Foot, and that is Richard Guicune, uh, who just looks to be a very, very solid goalkeeper, frankly. 170 grand. 170 grand. Uh, he's mostly gonna feature him on loan at the moment, but he's got very, very good straight up goalkeeping attributes. So there is a chance that he could maybe get in the team ahead of Burn over the coming season if he continues to develop at the rate that he might well be already. So we might have actually got our future goalkeeper in there too. But again, I'd like to find him alone if possible. Already has a cap for Senegal too. So how did all that translate to the league? Well, uh, pretty straightforward really. We did actually lose a game this year, but you can see that from the goal difference that we are starting to score a few more goals. And you'll also note that the gap to us and Hammer has definitely stretched. Now, weirdly, they were like neck and neck. And I think at one point, with only like maybe eight or nine games to go they were only four points behind us and then they just absolutely collapsed for some reason they just massively collapsed and the gap just got enormous over the second half of the season and in the end they actually only finished four points clear of Zabar and then obviously a little bit further clear of Luta but you can see now that especially with some of the loans that these guys have been taking and some of their own personal transfers frankly they've really started to make it look a lot better the goal differences alone should be the indicator that they are starting to improve relative to the rest of the league plus 23 and plus 15 it's quite a stark contrast from a few years ago where we were having teams qualify for Europe with like plus one or negative goal differences so to speak so they're definitely getting better and i think we're gonna have a really strong contingent in europe going into season nine and one of our loanies you'll see here abba alfred with 19 goals top scorer in the league for zabar and that's just what you love to see and also uh Lewis, top scorer also on loan from us ted van aken these are the sort of guys that we've been picking up and just giving them on loan fantastic news also shout out to otto uwilaki who's had to fill in for vida for most of the season this year ends up winning player of the year uh which is awesome for him in the second tier floriana do finally make a comeback to the top flight just two defeats all season and obviously tanich on loan there really was part of that revival for them really uh, only won the league by a point in the end with Tarshin but it definitely was the sort of season I'd expected out of them last year ironically but they finally got it this year but now on to Europe and again unfortunately missing those early games because of the match data thingy that will be fixed for next time we're gonna have to do it a little bit different again but the hope was again if we can get into the Europa League groups see what we can do maybe there's the outside shot of Champions League as well but it's generally speaking still a little bit unlikely for us but in our first round we drew against Celia of Slovenia 4-1 victory in the first leg actually lost the second leg 2-1 don't really know how that came about but it just was not a very good performance but the benefit is that set up a wonderful draw against Lincoln Red Imps of Gibraltar in the next round and well a 3-1 victory which was much more difficult than it should have been then followed up with a 4-0 victory away from home at least to give us a 7-1 and progression into the third round of the Champions League and then we drew Red Star Belgrade who obviously very very good side kind of figured we were going to end our journey there and it looked even more likely when we lost 2-1 in Serbia a bit unfortunate really um in that game I think we actually played quite well but then they just got I think it was a headed goal and then a penalty in the 90th minute as you do and then this happened uh we beat them 5-0 in Malta Palacio Watara G Guerrero Stuart Fraser and Cam and Lend with the goals absolutely destroyed them don't know how that came about but it did and it was absolutely fabulous from us to send us into the playoff round of the Champions League I think for the first time in the save and we were playing against Legia Vorshava and bear in mind 
I think, to me, they're a weaker side than Red Star. So we felt that we had a chance, which was made even more clear when we won the home leg by a goal to nil, giving us something to take back to Poland, which, well, we then managed to win 2-0 in Poland. Stuart Fraser and Henry Watara penalty gave us a 3-0 victory over Legia, and that put us in the Champions League league phase. God, I hate saying Champions League league phase for the first time and become the first multi side ever to reach that. And oh my goodness, the money. I think it's like 13 million quid you get just for reaching it. It's utterly bizarre. It like doubled our bank balance, which is unbelievable. And we knew we were going to be in for a baptism of fire this season, but then the breaks. And then we started off really poorly. Uh, went away to Levski, a team we'd beaten in the Europa League, literally earlier in this video, as you would have seen, and then lost 4-1. Now, I wish I could show you the match stats for this game um, because it haunts me still. Uh, they scored four goals off of 0.78. I know these numbers off by heart now because of how bad it was. And we got one off of 2.98. It's just one of those games where we battered them, couldn't get through, and they scored like four long-range strikes. Uh, very frustrating as we felt that was a winnable game and a chance for huge progress. Didn't get any better in the second match, though, as we lost 5-1 to PSV. We were in the game at 2-1, uh, and then Frank Basala got sent off, and then they scored three more goals after that and absolutely buried us. And we'd suddenly conceded nine goals in two games. And then it didn't get any easier as we faced off against PSG in the home game. A red card for a Fifi in this one did not help us, but what you'll notice is that we actually, technically from the red card point onwards, it was one all. We actually took the lead in this game against PSG as well. Fantastic. I'd say that a 5-2 defeat against a team like PSG, there's progress there, I'd say. Wasn't a lot of progress, though, in Turin as we travelled to Juve. Um, yeah, Benjamin Shesko just absolutely put us to the sword. Three goals for him. We were conceding a lot more goals than we maybe should have been but hey that's life sometimes it's the champions league after all but then we finally got it our first ever victory in the champions league group stages and a thoroughly deserved one a 3-0 victory against young boys camga and len with a goal and two goals from inters lignon which was very very surprising but we're really really happy for him unfortunately the injury to burnt vizniewski did not help us out there and watara also missed a penalty could have been more frankly but what a result and then things got better as we took a draw against Villarreal, who at the time were i believe third in the group and hadn't lost a game yet uh marius key was man of the match for us as well our backup goalkeeper at the time so just really really good to get an extra point that's four points on the board in the champions league kind of all went down the toilet as we traveled to germany against dortmund had nothing for them in the end as julian reikoff and julian reyerson uh just put us to the sword but then we pulled this out on the final day sirens two tottenham hotspur two it had to be spurs didn't it just always seems to be pierre gave us the lead in the eighth minute then unfortunately we gave away a stupid penalty papa matai saw got through our defense uh henry watara equalized for us in the 48th minute and the worst thing is we had a goal disallowed in the 93rd minute it was offside but holy shit we celebrated like we just won the world cup basically and then it gets disallowed uh it is how it is but that would have been a massive result for us but five points not bad in the end it left us 30th which is obviously quite poor but we weren't bottom we got five points on the board which is more than many teams including Bayern Munich and Bayer Leverkusen what's going on lads who didn't win a single match between them Bayern finished below us in the Champions League. They drew with Monaco, Levski, Young Boys, who we beat, and Feyenoord, and then lost to Atletico, PSG, Benfica, and Dortmund. Bear in mind, Benfica are also the reigning champions of the Champions League. I thought Benfica fans in the comments might like that. They also reached the semi-finals of the Champions League this year, and uh, were 3-0 up from the first leg, and then lost 5-0 to Real Madrid. So they damn near reached back-to-back -back finals. Probably should have done, really. As for the other Maltese sides, very difficult, because, of course, they now didn't get to go into the first round of the Conference League. They had to go into the second round. So, again, no more slapping about San Marini sides they actually had to start with difficult matches and Gudja couldn't have really had a worse draw really uh Lech Poznan but get a good result away from home like 3-2 is not a bad result in Poland but the 3-0 to home defeat they were never going to beat someone like Lech Poznan just a really bad draw but that's what the second round will do to you Hibernian on the other hand fared a little bit better got a 0-0 draw against Klaxvik and then actually beat them in the home game and they're not a muggy team by any means we saw how they do in real life but in FM they actually generally speaking go quite deep don't always qualify for the group but I've seen them get into it quite a few times and unfortunately they then drew Braga did score in both games at least so I think there's progress being made for them at least getting to the third round um considering they didn't have to play in the first round I think that's good progress to see Hibernian actually reach as far as that so we'll take that and that just kind of left Hamrun who actually got to play in the Europa League this year because of the shuffling around of things and well it went okay two all draw away from home in Lechia and we thought okay this is a chance but then the home game just wasn't it uh, the red card didn't particularly help them in that one but the goals were already in by that point and they actually scored after that so I don't know that was a real tough one for them I think had they gone through they would have actually played against Man United somehow something like that <laughs> no that can't have been right either way it would have been tough for them where they fared a lot better initially against Savail of uh, Azerbaijan with a 7-1 victory there they then played off against St. Pat's actually beat them 2-1 and St. Pat's are a good side they were in the Europa League group no not more than two seasons ago in this save so they're a decent team but then against Spartak Trinava that 
3-0 away defeat was just absolutely crippling for them, unfortunately. Just couldn't get it done. Um, but they did at least reach the playoff round. I think there is definitely progress being made now for these teams, and particularly with the strength that we're going to have in Europe next year with Zabar and Luta, finally, along with Hamrun and their improvements, I think that next year we're going to have someone in the group stage of the Conference League, and that is going to be a big deal because of the money they get, but also just because the extra coefficient points on the board. I think there's a real chance and they're starting to establish a top four now. And that's really important in the first few seasons of a building a nation is to have four teams that can just kind of do stuff with us being one of them, of course. It seems like a disappointing year and it kind of was. 4.75, it's still ironically our second best year of the save so far. But the biggest issue and the reason we weren't anywhere near that is because one, we were in the Champions League. So way less coefficient points to be gained from the matches in the groups. And also with them missing that early qualifying round, they just missed out on a load of free wins. And that would have probably got us another two points by itself. So that's the reason. But needless to say, it did actually still end up being a season of growth. As you'll see, we move above Hungary, who were losing an absolutely um, ridiculous year and replaced it with quite an average year. And as a result, we do move into 27th this season. But you can see the gap is starting to come down to some of those nations above. And it's just about us starting to progress a little bit more. I think if we can be in the Europa League next year and hopefully have a team in the Conference League with us, maybe have like another seven or an eight point year, that does start to bridge that gap and starts to catch us up with the likes of Poland, actually, and Norway and Czechia and people like that. Right, so I promised you youth intake stuff from earlier um, i'm gonna let the clip speak for itself show me something i just want solid tackling just give me like 12 tackling or 15 tackling that is fine as well holy shit matthew said let me actually play for you one day he's got solid physicals got a he's six foot five chat he is six foot five at the age of 60. <laughs> i mean and this is he this is matthew saeed uh, he <laughs> he's actually decent um the fact that he's six foot five is just a side note in many ways but six foot five good on both feet consistent as well which is fabulous great tackling which you know really doesn't improve very much um we're retraining in fact he's already got the role bloody hell that was fast i uh, already retrained by that halfback role for us and i think he could actually be a usable player one day maybe not given that but either way i think he's definitely a future multis international without a shadow of a doubt and might potentially end up being one of the best we're getting some quite decent ca on a lot of our youth players they just don't have the potential ceiling and i wonder if that's just because malta's youth level is very very low but we've got really good junior coaching so we're at least getting okay players in to begin with and then they kind of fall off but either way really really happy with matthew matthew said matthew saeed either way he's fantastic stats wise for the year wataro with 27 is fantastic melman though playing as the trek for the second half of the year once he'd learned it and got a bit better in some of his progression you can actually see now that from earlier in the video in fact his off the ball his anticipation composure decisions they've all definitely improved over the course of the last sort of year and a half to the point where he's now a very very capable striker and can actually play the trek to a reasonable level now which means we might start working on his passing soon actually try and get that up a little bit i think he's an excellent player and you know 17 goals and 11 assists certainly shows that camga did it again 16 goals 11 assists what an absolute beast guerrero with 16 as well has played less matches this year too so very very happy for him now you'll see on assists that otu are we lucky uh our sort of second choice right back for most of the time third choice now i uh, got 17 assists this season and that's because vida xenia as you'll see down here with only nine only played 13 matches so basically, a couple of games into the qualifiers, he broke his ankle, was out for four months with that. So he came back in like December, tried to wean him back into football with like 25 minutes or something in an under 23 game, tore his ankle ligaments in that game, was out for another four months, didn't return until mid-April, and then played a couple of matches and is now out with a sprained ankle for six to seven weeks. He basically has got an ankle that's barely attached to his leg over the course of this season. Doesn't even have injury proneness. That's the weirdest thing about him. And as a result, has missed almost the entire season. Still managed nine assists in his 13 appearances. So if he'd played the whole year, he would have been amazing. But that's just life. Um, nice to see like Palacio contribute nine assists this year. Haidara with six. Still lots of assists coming through. But the loss of Vidazinia for most of this season has been a real hard-hitting one for us because he could have been into the 30s, I think, this year if he'd just been able to stay fit. Hopefully, over the course of the next year, we can just sort of baby him into actually being able to play for us more regularly. But it has in the emergence of Otto Uelaki, like 17 assists this year is absolutely unbelievable from him. Shows that it's more about the position than purely on the player, but I feel like if he was a better player, he would have got more. Unfortunately, he turned down a contract extension and is now joining Slovan Bratislava, so we won't be seeing any more of Otto Uelaki, but still, nevertheless, I've been very pleased with what he's done this year. Right, Loan Farm. Now, if you remember, we had 66 players out on loan, but then I released like 25 of them. Well, we've got 73 now. Uh, so it's definitely working in the right direction. I reckon if I hadn't have released a lot of those guys that were out on loan to test the theory, we'd probably be close to like 95 loans at this point, which is a huge step in the right direction. Um, 
and also it's worth noting that technically we're actually a month further ahead on stream but i wanted to do this video from here so that i could show you the stats for the, the games this season i actually get a further six guys out on loan of the players that join us on the first day of the transfer window i think it was like six of the seven guys that join us get immediate loans so something's definitely going right for us now and it feels like normality has been restored we've managed to bring the other teams up to the point now where they are willing to take our loans again which was a scary time for us but it seems to be working quite nicely and you can see that there's been some real pro uh, Albert alfred 22 goals ted van arken 21 there uh panazio with 15 uh pablo de jesus for saint Leia with 12 these are all brand new loans for this year as far as i'm aware uh top of sister anyone crazy in there uh peep Schick as well of luta with 13 it seems to cap out the ability of the players that are out on loan around about two stars we can't seem to get anyone out who's got slightly higher than two stars but it hasn't stopped us getting a couple of like nearly five star potential chaps out on loan too i expect to be talking about season nine with us into the mid 90s in terms of players out on loan that's my hope anyway if it's gone right and we get the right things working for us finances obviously are now absolutely to the moon uh we're extending the stadium again it's going to go close to like i think it was seven and a half thousand now which is going to be sick and obviously our budget doubled as a result of the fact that we got 13 million for qualifying for the champions league you get tv money there too solidarity payments gate receipts too although admittedly gate receipts would have been less this year just because unfortunately we were playing in hyperion stadium instead of the national team stadium we could have filled that with 17k people for psg but no multis fa said no and our goal for next year and the season that you're currently seeing over on stream i realize this has been a long video but we had a lot to catch up on uh is hopefully get in the Europa League, generally speaking. I think it's unlikely we're going to get back in the Champions League this year, but you never know. I just think perhaps it would be better for us if we were in the Europa League, because I think we could maybe make a bit more of a dent in that. Um, this hasn't been all matches, of course, but generally speaking, it's been Kamga and Lend and a Fifi. Petrovic is just a guy I took on loan from um, Red Star for half a season. It's not really worth showing you because he's leaving anyway. Uh, Watara and Melmon most of the time with Guerrero in there as well. Um, Vida when he's fit, uh, and then Uelaki or Ndoy, who of course joined us in January. Palacio and Haidara in there. Sunday or... Uh, bowling Fane, uh, which is his actual name. Um, th th this is him. Chat and I very much misread that initially, as you would imagine. And then the back line with Basala, Jorgensen, Lignon, sometimes Safer, sometimes others. It's mostly been Jorgensen, Lee, Lignon, and then one other. And then either Guicone or, of course, Vizniewski occupying the goalkeeping spots. It's looking good for us, and I've got very high hopes for the future. So anyway, that was an extremely long video. Uh, I do realise that, but uh, sometimes needs must. They should be going back to like one per season now for the remainder of this. It's going to be nice to get back into making some wacky experiment content as well for you lot as well so i'm looking forward to that and obviously i'm going to malta to watch a sirens game uh, at the end of the month too so hopefully we'll be able to make a video out there as well which is going to be really cool so yes uh, join us over on stream where hopefully we're getting lots of loans out and not not complaining about how difficult it is um hopefully some of these tips will have helped you with the loan stuff for yourselves and uh, yeah if you've enjoyed drop a like if you're new subscribe to the channel and i'll see you guys very very soon hold your gun capybara bye bye